As previously mentioned, exponential and logarithmic models are extremely useful in various um, population and radioactive decay modeling situations. This is the simplest growth and decay model. It says that the amount of material or population size present at time t is exponential with some constant in the middle and some initial amount p0. So let's just label this equation to keep track of it. On the left hand side we have the amount or number of things at time t, whereas on the right hand side this k stands for the growth or decay constant depending on the scenario that uh, you are describing. If it is a growth constant, it will be positive. If it's a decay constant, it will be negative. Um, T is, of course, time. And then this P naught is the initial amount. So let's actually sketch the two different scenarios, the positive or the growth scenario, and the negative or the decay scenario. So in terms of the graphs, both are exponential functions. And if we're thinking um, that whether the growth or decay occurs with time, we will be only looking at the positive values of t. So if the constant is positive, that represents exponential growth, I'm going to have some kind of um, initial amount of, let's say, population or the number of infected individuals. And then afterwards, my function will grow whereas this is p naught. If k is negative, that represents the decay scenario, I will start with p naught, but my function will exponentially decay. So here I'm not showing you the tail on this end, it's right there. On the decay constant, um, the negative will be coming from the side of the increase, and then it will be decreasing afterwards. Also notice that this initial amount, um, we just take the uh, convenience of labeling it P naught, but if I were to actually plug in time equals zero into the entire equation, I would get P naught e to power k times zero, because now t is zero. And then of course, this is e to power zero, which is just one, which results in P naught. That is why that constant in front of the exponential portion here is the initial amount. Australian cane toads or giant toads were introduced in Australia in 1935 with the purpose to fight cane beetle, which at the time was the main pest of the sugar cane, which was a big industry in Australia. Um, the native land of these guys is South America. Um, however, their introduction, while seemingly theoretically reasonable, really backfired. What happened was um, there was a certain asynchrony in the reproductive cycles or life cycles in general of the cane toads and the cane beetles, which meant that while the cane beetles were eating all the sugar cane, the toads were more or less hibernating. Um, the other issue was the fact that the toads reproduce greatly and they have really, really voracious appetite, which is why they were supposed to be really good for eating cane beetles. Unfortunately, the other huge issue is the fact that their skin is extremely poisonous, which makes them almost invincible to all types of predators. And in fact, they've been labeled one of the worst um, pests because they have no natural predator and they're also poisonous to domesticated animals as well. Since then, um, the government has tried a number of techniques to control the population um, and more or less not really successfully, which serves as another lesson that if you mess with an ecosystem, you might have another thing coming. Now, because uh, this is such a big issue, their population and particularly the spread of the territory they're covering have been greatly studied. Um, they've been studied since 1939. They were introduced in 1935. And we will first use this simplified model to track or try to model what their uh, territorial coverage has been throughout the years. Um, year zero will correspond to the first year we have data for, which is 1939. So the first question is, if I have two pieces of information. In 1939, they occupied 35,800 square kilometers. And in 1949, they occupied 73,600 kilometers. I would like to find what we call a solution 
to this model, which really means finding the unknowns, which in this case are the initial population and the growth slash decay constant. Okay, so let's write out all the pieces of information that we actually have here, which of course is, first of all, in the year 1939, we have that the total occupied area was 32,800, which means that at time t equals zero, once again, I can either remember that this stands for the initial amount or I can plug in t equals zero, and we will see that a naught is equal to 32,800. The next piece of information that I have something about is the year 1949, which then of course corresponds to T equals 10. And then I know that the total occupied area was 73,600. So this number corresponds to the right-hand side of this equation. I already know the number for A naught, R is what I'm after, and T will be 10. Okay, so overall, I have the equation that 73,600 equals to A naught, which is 32,800 e to power r, which I still don't know, times t, which is 10. This is really good news because this is an equation with only one unknown, r, and I can solve it for r. So solving for r here, I will have that it is the logarithm of 73,600 divided by 32,800 all over 10, and that comes out to be approximately 0 0.081. Okay, which means that now I know all of the constants in my model, and I can rewrite this as A naught is 32,800 e to power r, which is 0 0.081 t. I can see that this is indeed a growth model because the value for R is positive. And with that in mind, I can approach the second part of the question that says now using my newly discovered model, I am going to estimate the area occupied by toads in 2020 with the, of course, assumption that the model back from the 30s and 40s still works. So with no great changes to the environment. So what happens in 2020 is the total amount is going to be 32,800 e to power 0.081 times t that corresponds to 2020. Well, t equals zero corresponding to 1939. So t that corresponds to 2020 will be 2020 minus 1939. Okay, so plugging all of this back in, I'm going to get approximately 22,856,304 kilometers square. So of course, unbounded growth ends up in really, really fast spread if nothing actually happens in terms of the control of the pest. Um, the other really um, interesting application of the exponential functions is Newton's law of cooling, which states uh, what the temperature of an object is in terms of the ambient temperature of the environment, the initial temperature of the object, as well as some cooling constant K. Now, the first thing to notice here is that this cooling constant K, because the object is cooling, is going to be negative. Um, you can think of the situation as, let's say, um, a cake taken out of the oven into a much cooler room and the cake actually being cooled down in the ambient temperature of the room. Um, let's consider, first of all, the general setup. So uh, let's think about what actually does happen at time equals zero. Um, so if I plug in t equals zero into here, what am I going to get? I'm going to get t a plus t naught minus t a e to power k times zero. Now, of course, anything to power zero is just one. So this is one. So overall, I have t a plus t naught minus t a. Then the two t a's will cancel and I'm going to get t naught, which means that the notation is reasonable. That temperature at time zero is in fact T naught. Um, another thing to think about is what do we expect the eventual temperature of the 
cooling down object to be. So let's take a limit as t goes to infinity of the temperature function. So I have the limit as t goes to infinity of t a plus t naught minus t a times e to the k t. Now it is essential here to remember that my constant k is in fact negative. So this guy right here is negative. And remember what the negative, what the e to the negative power looks like as a graph. It is going towards zero on the right hand side, which means that this portion approaches zero. Anything times zero is zero, which means that this part of my function approaches zero. And therefore, as the limit, I just have ta, which means that eventually the cooling down object will reach the temperature of the ambient environment. That also makes sense. If I take a cake out of the oven and place it at room temperature, eventually the cake will in fact reach the room temperature. And that um, justifies what we might think of as a rough sketch of the graph of this function. So let's say this is my ambient temperature right here. That's something that my object is going to approach. It's not going to do below it unless we introduce something else into the picture. And the initial temperature T0 starts up above it. Again, we're thinking in terms of cooling down, not heating up. So the temperature of my cooling down object will approach the ambient temperature, never going below it, but probably eventually actually reaching it. Okay, so let's see how this can be used in applications. One of the coolest applications that one can think of in terms of cooling down objects is how a blacksmith actually tempers the metal and then cools it down before they can temper it some more. So let's take a look at how a farrier works on a horseshoe. In order for, for that, let's first of all take a look at what does that actually mean? What does the farrier's job actually involve? The goal of the unit is always the horse, and the horse is the most uh, important priority that we have. I'm just going to take the shoe off, my crease nail pullers. And without the horses, we wouldn't be a mounted unit. So everything that we do here is for the benefit of the horse. My little friend, how are you? I often try to talk to these animals because, like anything else, when you're having anything done, it's always easier to get done when you're talking to something or someone. The mounted unit was established in 1858. We're the oldest and largest mounted unit in North America. There's a very special relationship between a mounted police officer and the public. We have four facilities spread throughout the city. We have over 100 officers, over 50 horses, and three full-time department horseshoers on staff. They're here every day. That's really the goal of the farrier. We try to keep the horse in service and comfortable and safe. Because believe it or not, it is 2,000 pounds of dead weight on top of four tiny feet. But I've been showing this horse for almost 10 years straight, and he knows me, I know him. And that's really the goal of the farrier. We try to keep the horse in service and comfortable and safe. It is a dream job. It's not even a job, really. We're kind of spoiled. What's up, handsome? You're all right, man. I know, I know, I know. So as you saw in the video, the farrier actually molds the horseshoe to the horse, which means that he or she has to constantly work on the shoe until it reaches the right shape. So once they are working on it, they have to, before putting it on, cool it down to a temperature where the horse will be comfortable at. And this is what this question is about. The question says that while the horseshoer is working on the horseshoe, the actual metal is heated up to 400 degrees Celsius to be in fact um, mendy enough. And then they dunk it in 25 degree or room temperature water. The water around the horseshoe stops boiling in about 30 seconds and the horseshoe is safe to put on the horse when it's at approximately 60 degrees Celsius. What we're wondering is when does that happen? So how long should a farrier keep the horseshoe in the water for it to cool down to the temperature that the horse will find comfortable um, to be put on. 
Okay, so this is our Newton's law of cooling. This is just a general formula from the previous slide. And let's fill all the information in that we have in this question. So the left-hand side here will be the temperature of the horseshoe. TA, the ambient temperature, of course, the horseshoe gets dunked into the water. So the ambient temperature corresponds to the water temperature, which in this case is 25 degrees Celsius in both cases here. And then T naught is the initial temperature of the horseshoe. While the fire is working, it's 400 degrees Celsius. So this is 400 degrees. The one unknown is still the cooling constant, and that is something that we're going to have to solve for using other information provided in the question. Now, before we do that, let's put together what we have so far. So I have 25 plus, and then this is going to be 400 minus 25, which is 375 e to power kt. So this is my best uh, model so far. Still don't know k, but I have all of the other constants in place. So the other piece of information we have not used yet is the fact that the water around the horseshoe stops boiling in 30 seconds. I know that the boiling part, uh, point of the water is 100 degrees Celsius, so it's safe to assume that in 30 seconds, the temperature of the water around the shoe is 99 degrees Celsius. So let's record that. In 30 seconds, the temperature, whoops, in 30 seconds is 99 degrees Celsius. Now, instead of writing it this way, we're going to write it inside our model. So the temperature is 99 degrees at the time of 30 seconds. Okay, so just matching the model to what I have, replacing the time with 30 and replacing the left-hand side with my actual temperature, I have an equation like this. The only constant here is k, and we can easily solve for that. I'm going to skip the steps, but you should get the number that is approximately minus 0 0.0541. This is a really good time to stop and make sure that you're on track in terms of constant. The cooling constant has to be negative in this case, which it is, so it seems like at least our algebra is working out okay. Now, the question is, when can the farrier put on the horseshoe? And that is when the temperature is at 60 degrees Celsius. So what we want to know is for what time T is the temperature equal to 60 degrees Celsius? And once again, we're going to take it through the model here. So the temperature on the left-hand side here has to be 60 degrees for the horse to be comfortable and the right hand side is here. Now I know my constant k and I will be after the value for the time t on the right hand side. Okay, so altogether the equation I have is 60 is equal to 25 plus 375 e to power k which we've just discovered was 0 0.0541 times t. Once again, this equation simply has one unknown, which is t, and we can solve for it. I'm also going to skip the steps here, um, and t will work out to be approximately 43.8. This is time. Be careful in units, it says seconds here, so our time all along was in seconds. So the horse shoe will be cool enough cool down to 60 degrees Celsius and therefore be able to put on the horse in 43.8 seconds. Please make sure you actually go through these simplifications and solve for these values just to make sure you have enough practice solving exponential and logarithmic equations here. One word of um, caution is it's easiest to solve these equations if you first isolate the term that has the constant in it. So do not apply logarithms to both sides until you have the e to whatever power completely isolated. So move, let's say, 25 over to the left here, then divide everything by 375, and then apply logarithms. Make sure you go through this because there will be more problems like these in class and, of course, on tests. For the next application, let's consider how carbon passes through the atmosphere, as well as the living and then dead things. So it gets formed in cosmos and passes down to Earth in the shape of nitrogen-14. This particular carbon, nitrogen-14, is then 
formed in the upper atmosphere where it passes through all the living things, including plants and animals. However, once that living thing that collects carbon-14 within the Earth dies, carbon-14 once again changes back to nitrogen-14. And therefore, we can use this um, idea of how much carbon there is in a fossil to figure out when did carbon stop being produced and started turning into nitrogen. Carbon-14 is one of the elements that is actually fairly easy to detect and to measure. So this is the general uh, material that we look after in terms of carbon dating of the various fossils. It has its limitations, which we're going to discuss in a little while. But for now, let's take a look at the following application. So we know that the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. We're going to assume one thing, and that is the fact that the trees that grow today have the same amount of carbon-14 as they did in prehistoric times. So the amount of carbon that the trees absorb through the atmosphere has not changed through the times with, let's say, industrial revolution or anything like that. Next, we are going to say that we found ourselves an ancient axe, and we determined that it contains only 40% of carbon-14 compared to a living tree. So that means that 60% of its carbon-14 has already turned into nitrogen-14. How can we use this information to determine the age of the axe? So first of all, we're going to assume that carbon-14 um, breaks down exponentially according to the decay model that we have seen already in this lecture. So my model, if you recall, is the amount of the element P of T is equal to P naught e to power kT. Now here we're talking about decay, so my constant k is going to be negative. And if I want to quickly sketch what is happening with the amount of carbon-14, just to visualize things a little bit, what we have is I'm going to have a exponential decay model, so a graph that looks like this. Now, if we're going to start with time zero, then of course I'm going to not have the actual um, part of the function that happened in the negative time, but to be mathematically complete, I'm actually going to draw all parts of it for now. And I know that this amount right here is actually p naught, so this is the initial amount of carbon, and then as time goes on, it decays by half every 5,730 years. So first of all, the very first step we're going to do is figure out this constant of decay, k. We're going to use some information from our problem to figure that out. And in fact, the information that we're going to use is exactly the half-life information. So use half-life information to determine the value of our constant k. Now, if you want to pause the video here and try to figure this out by yourself, by all means, do so. Now, what we have is in 5,730 years, the amount of carbon is going to half from the initial. The initial amount is p naught. That means that when t is 5,730, my total amount is going to be half of the initial. Half of the initial is p naught over 2, and that's exactly the amount I'm going to have in 5,730 years. Okay, take a close look at this equation and make sure you understand how it got formed. When my t is 5,730, my total amount is half of the amount that I started with. Okay, this is how we form this equation. And then I can see that, of course, I can cancel p naught on each side. And my only variable in this equation is k. So if I solve it for k, I should be able to find out its exact value. So I can say that, well, I've canceled p naughts. so what I have is 1 half is e to power k5730. And then I can take lawns of both sides, and I can bring the power down, and so on. I'm going to skip a couple of steps that I encourage you to fill out, 
but these are pre-calculus type steps. What we're going to have is k is going to be equal to ln of 1 half divided by 5730 or approximately negative 0 0.000121. First common sense check is the fact that k is negative, as it should be, because it is in fact a decay. So if you have gotten yourself a positive number, you know that you've done something wrong along the way. Now that I have that, I can replace k with this value in my original equation. Now let's actually figure out what it is that we're asked to find in the problem itself, given that we already know what the decay constant is. We know that the x we found has 40% of the original amount of carbon-14, and we're asked to determine its age, which means that in this model, we're actually after t. So first of all, let's actually set up the equation for dating of the x. Set up equation for our x. And what we have here is, on the right-hand side, I'm going to have p naught e to the power of k, which I can substitute with my newly found value for it, times t, right? This t actually represents the time from the death of the tree that the axis formed out of to today. So this t really represents how old the axis. And the left-hand side of the equation has to represent the amount of carbon-14 that is still in the ax, which is 40% of the original. So 40% of p naught is going to be 0.4 p naught Notice that I don't actually have to know how much exactly there is in the original. I just need to know that there's 40% of it because now both sides of the equation have P0 and I can cancel it out and then solve for T in very similar manner as I solved for K earlier. So a few pre-calculus steps later, I can figure out that T is approximately 7,574 years. Now, depending on how you rounded this value for k everywhere, you might get a slightly different number for t, simply due to actual rounding estimation. The one thing that's important to notice here is that while 5,730 seems like a long half-life, it is good for um, dating things that essentially have, existence, have existed since humans have existed. Um, however, it is not very good at dating things like dinosaur fossils. So in order to actually date dinosaur fossils, we're going to have to think about a different element with a much larger half-life because this is not going to be long enough to actually detect any kind of presence in the dinosaur bones. Dinosaurs are much older than that, and therefore the amount of carbon-14 in their bones is going to be basically non-existent. We will be looking at elements... Um, of the different kind of a much longer half-life to be able to date much older objects. And I encourage you to look up exactly what kind of radioactive elements are used in the dating of the dinosaur fossils. We're going to be looking at a few other applications of the, these um, growth and decay models. And here's the next one, talking about fish populations and comparing two different types of fish. And in particular, the two types of fish that live in Cultus Lake are sturgeon population that we're going to describe with this equation, and a rainbow trout population that we're going to describe with this equation. The question itself is asking about whether the populations are growing or declining. Given the initial levels, when are the two populations going to be exactly equal? And then it's also asking us to actually sketch both of those graphs to see how the two populations interact um, in terms of growth and decay with each other. Now, there's nothing in this question that is brand new. In fact, there's not even calculus component. This is all pre-calculus skills, but with a calculus model. So I encourage you to pause the video here and try to get through this question by yourself at first. So the first part is asking about growth and decay. All we have to take a look at are the models themselves. So for the sturgeon here, we have that it starts off with S0 as the initial population and the constant of growth in the exponent is negative, which of course indicates a decline. For rainbow trout, we take a look at its equation. R0 is going to be the initial population of the trout, but the constant in the exponent is positive, which indicates growth. So in order to determine whether the population is growing or declining, all you have to do is take a look at the sign of the constant of growth or decay. 
So in terms of S of T, because the constant of <clears throat> growth is negative, it is actually going to be a decline. And for the rainbow trout, because the constant in the exponent is positive, it is going to indicate the actual growth. Now, the next part is giving us additional information about the initial levels, so S0 and R0. The initial levels are supposed to be 300 and 1300, respectfully. So that means that I can rewrite my models using the actual initial levels here. So for my sturgeon, I have 300, and for my rainbow trout, I have 1300. The question then asks, when are the two populations are going to be exactly equal? Remember that the left-hand side of the equation represents the number of species in the population at time t. So these two are going to be equal exactly where their right-hand sides are equal as well. So we can set both of these to be equal to each other. Whoops. Write the entire equation, not just a part of it. And then we're going to solve for the value of t when that happens, which will give us the time when that actually occurs. If you haven't paused the video yet, I encourage you to pause it here so you can actually practice solving with exponential and logarithmic equations here again, and also to see if you reach the conclusion that you reach and be able to interpret this by yourself. Now, I've mentioned this before, solving exponential equations is better if you can isolate to have e only on one side. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to divide both sides by the, let's say, the right-hand side. So I'm going to rewrite this here and rewrite this here. And the equation I'm going to get from that is going to turn out to be 300 divided by... 1300 is equal to e to power 3t. Okay, remember then when you're dividing, you're subtracting um, from the powers. And here I've moved my e to the 3t over to the right-hand side to keep the exponent positive. Now, if I take logarithms of both sides, I will notice that my equation is going to turn into t is equal to ln of 300 over 1300 divided by 3. And if you compute this number in a calculator, you will notice that it is in fact negative, which means that there is no solutions in this problem. So that means that my two populations are never exactly equal. Now the next part is asking to sketch both graphs of both of the populations and maybe it will give us some clue as to why there is no solutions that we managed to find in part 2. So here I'm going to start with no scale of any kind. I am interested more in the qualitative uh, way that these functions behave rather than um, specific qualitative things. But let's see, my sturgeon starts off at 300 and is declining. So I know I'm going to have an exponential decay shape where my point of intersection here is 300. So again, it doesn't quite exist for t less than 0 because we're going to assume that time starts at 0 for some value of t, but it then carries on. So this is my sturgeon population graph. My rainbow trout population starts off at 1300 and grows. So I know that because it grows, it's going to have an exponential growth um, shape. And it starts off at 1300. So pardon this really not to scale graph here. But again, I'm more interested in the overall um, qualitative behavior rather than specifics of the scale. So this is my rainbow trout population. And it becomes very clear that while they do intersect for negative t, as we found, they will never intersect for positive t. Because the population that starts lower is declining, and the population that starts higher is increasing. So, of course, they will be diverging from each other. They never intersect on the positive side, which again confirms our conclusion in the context. There are, in fact, no solutions. Make sure you go through this question and you understand each part of it. How to determine, simply based on the two functions, whether the population is growing or declining, 
what it means for them to be equal, and how you can produce qualitative graphs like that. For our next application, we're going to come back to Newton's law of cooling and the standard formula that it is described by. This particular example I'm going to leave as extra practice for you to do. It is very similar to the Farrier's question earlier on in the lecture. I'm going to focus my attention on this next example of murder mystery because the setup here is a little bit more different and a little bit more complicated. So what we have uh, to ourselves here is a forensics problem. At 2 a.m., police discovers Dr. Watson's body and the temperature of the body is 21 degrees Celsius. At 3 a.m., they take the temperature of the body again, and it has now cooled down to 17 degrees Celsius. We're going to assume that the outside temperature was 7 degrees all night, and the question that we're interested in is, of course, when was Dr. Watson killed? So the change in the temperature with the two different times should allow us to apply the Newton's law of cooling in order to calculate the K, the cooling down constant, and then figure out at what time Dr. Watson's temperature was our normal body temperature, which we assume is, for example, 70, uh, 37 degrees Celsius. So in order to set this up, let's actually create a timeline of the events so that we are clear on what happened when. So let's represent the timeline by a straight line, and we're going to assume that at some point Dr. Watson died or was killed. We're not drawing any conclusions yet. This time we're going to call t equals zero. At some later point in time, at 2 a.m. is when the police found him and were able to actually check for his temperature. So this time we will call simply t. We don't know what was the difference between the time of death and when the body was found. So this is going to be one of our unknowns. But we also have another point in time at which we have information about the temperature of the body, it's 3 a.m. Now, if 2 a.m. is t, and we're going to measure our time in hours, then 3 a.m. is going to be t plus 1, an hour later. Another assumption we're going to make is that, as I already said, that at time of death, the temperature of the body was normal. And so let's say it should be anywhere between 36 and 37 degrees. Let's say it was 37 degrees Celsius, and immediately after death, the body started to cool down. Recall that Newton's law of cooling formula that we had on the previous slides and a few slides earlier says that the temperature at time t is equal to the temperature of the environment plus the initial temperature of the object minus the temperature of the environment raised to the power of e to the kt. Now, here we have some information about both the temperature, the ambient temperature, and the temperature of the object to begin with. What we don't know is at what time it was found and the actual constant of cooling. So let's fill in this formula with all the information that we do know. The ambient temperature was the temperature of the air at night, so 7 degrees. The Initial temperature of the object of the body was 37, so we have 37, minus again the ambient temperature, which is 7 degrees here. And this is what we have overall. If I just put together the two terms in the brackets, I am going to get 7 plus 30 e to the power k t. Now, you can leave it as k, or you can also adjust it a little bit and realize that because the body is cooling, this term is going to be negative. So we could introduce the minus in there all along. It really depends on how you prefer to work with it. Because the previous examples had the plus, I'm actually going to introduce the minus to highlight the fact that the actual law describes the general situation, but in my particular case, a cooling is taking place. So first, we need to find the value for k the cooling constant. How are we going to do that? Well, we have two points in time at which we know the temperature of the body. So we're going to use this information, plug it into the Newton's law of cooling at those two different points in time. So create two equations, one for 2 a.m. and one for 3 a.m. and then try to use the two together to solve for k. I encourage you to pause the video here and actually try this for yourself to see if you're able to obtain the value for k.
So as I mentioned, we're going to have two equations at 2 a.m. and at 3 a.m. So at 2 a.m., the temperature was 21. So in my Newton's law of cooling, the left-hand side is going to be 21. And the right-hand side is going to correspond to the formula at time t. Because remember, we assigned t to time 2 a.m. At 3 a.m., the temperature was 17 degrees. And the right-hand side is going to correspond to the formula at time t plus 1. Because remember, t plus 1 is the time at 3 a.m. And now we have two of these equations together. We have two variables, k and t. And so we're going to put the two together somehow in order to solve for k. It really doesn't matter how you solve it from here on. There are a number of different ways to do it, and I encourage you to practice the way that you find most comfortable. Um, what I'm going to do at first is move these two constants over. So I have isolated e to the power of something on one of the sides. Okay, so I'm going to take both of these together, and I'm going to simplify the equations a little bit. So I have 14 equals 30e to the minus kt, and I have 10 equals 30e to the minus kt plus 1. And again, there are now a number of ways to do it. Here's one way to solve these equations. And once again, I encourage you to pause and think of what way would you think of first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of the equations, let's say the second one, and I'm going to massage it a little bit to see if there is any way that I can change up the right-hand side to use the first equation in the series. So I'm going to start with the second equation. So I have 30e to the minus kt plus 1. I'm going to open up the brackets there. So I have minus kt minus k. And then I'm going to notice that that means that I can actually split up this e. Remember that when we multiply two exponents together, we actually add the powers. So here I'm going to apply this rule, but in the opposite direction. I'm going to split up this e into two different pieces. So I'm going to have e to the minus kt times e to the minus k. Make sure that you understand that these are actually the same expression. And now what I notice is this 30e to the minus kt is actually equal to 14 according to my first equation here. So I can actually use this information to replace this term in my equation here. And that is really pretty convenient because what I end up with is 14, because now this entire term is equal to 14, e to the negative k. Now let's take a look at my leftmost side and my rightmost side. What do I have? I have a very simple equation. 10 is equal to 14 e to the minus k. There's no t anymore. I can solve directly for k. So from here, solving for k will give me that k is equal to ln of 10 over 14, whatever actual number that ends up being. Once I have my value for k, I can plug it into either one of these equations to figure out the value for t. Remember that it is actually t I'm after in the very, very end. So now I can finally proceed with solving for t. Now we can solve for t. So let's say I'm going to plug my value for k back into this first equation. It looks a little simpler than the second one anyways. So what do I get? I have 14 is equal to 30 e to the negative k, so ln 10 over 14, times t. Now notice that this is just a number, so if it makes you more comfortable, calculate the decimal in your calculator. I prefer to carry through calculator-ready exact expressions. Um, the only variable you have is t here. So by using standard pre-calculus methods to solve for t, you can get t out of here, and it's going to equal to approximately 2.26. So that means, according to our timeline here, going back to the previous slide, this t is approximately two and a quarter hours, which means that 2 a.m. is approximately two and a quarter hours after the time of death, which means that Dr. Watson was killed approximately two and a quarter hours before uh, it was, his body was discovered, and therefore you can figure out the actual time of death.
Next up, let's take a look at so-called von Bertalanffy growth curve. The von Bertalanffy growth curve is actually used to describe how the size L, which is normally the length of an animal, for example, a fish, changes with time. This particular model is actually the most accurate in describing fish growth, and so we're going to see throughout a few examples in the class. So the model looks a little bit complicated when you first take a look at it. Let's break it up into pieces to see um, what constants correspond to what. So T here measures time after birth. A and B are two different constants that are actually describing uh, the growth, much like K in the previous example is describing the rate of cooling. Here A and B describe the rate of growth of a particular type of, for example, fish. And T0 is yet another parameter. In the first part of this question, we're actually asked to evaluate L of T0 and think about what that actually means about T0. The simple notation that we use for it should probably give you a hint at the fact that this is likely the initial length of the animal, for example, at birth. But let's evaluate it to confirm whether or not our intuition is correct. So if we are computing L of T0, all I have to do is replace T with T0 everywhere I see it. T only appears really in one place, so I'm going to replace it with T0 right here. So I'm going to have A times 1 minus E to the negative B T0 minus T0. Now, of course, we can see now that T0 minus T0 is equal to 0, which means that the entire exponent here is equal to 0. So I have e to power 0 instead. Let me write out in careful steps here. There we go. Now, anything to power 0 is just 1. So I have 1 minus 1. 1 minus 1, of course, is 0. a times 0 is equal to 0. So that means that for this particular model, in time L0, the actual length, the initial length of the animal was 0. So let's write this down. At time T0, length of the animal was 0, whatever animal it is that you're considering. Now, the next part is asking us to explore what happens as time goes off to infinity. So thinking, again, mathematically, uh, that is possible. Thinking realistically, that just means that we are wondering what is the limiting length of the actual animal? What is sort of the largest limiting size that that particular fish, for example, is going to approach as they reach adulthood. We notice that, of course, all animals have some sort of limiting size. Um, at some point, we're not going to grow much more than we've already grown. Now, what I'm going to do is, first of all, replace L of t in my expression, in my limit, with the actual expression for it. And then I'm going to think about what happens to the terms that I am looking at here. Okay? So, I am asked to compute the limit as t goes to infinity, which means this t is going to go to infinity. So I know that this is in the power. This goes off to infinity. I'm going to subtract some initial length of the animal, which is going to be a small number. So that means that in my brackets here, I still have infinity. And therefore, this whole thing is going to infinity here. Now I'm going to multiply by negative b, b was told that uh, it was told to us that b is a positive parameter so that means that if i multiply by a negative b here my entire power here is going to go to negative infinity and so what i'm asked to now compute is e to the negative infinity in the limit now remember that negative infinity in the power means i am doing one over e to some very very large value, which means that this entire term is actually going to approach zero. And so what I have overall is a times one minus zero. And therefore, in the limit here, I have a. So that implies that in the long run, as time goes off to some large number, or mathematically speaking, to infinity, the length of my animal approaches a. So let's write that down. So in the long run, or sort of the end behavior, the length will approach 
this value a. So that means that in my original model, this a actually describes the limiting length of the animal, and this b will somehow describe the growth rate during the time of the growth of that animal. If you actually draw yourself um, this curve for a few different parameters a and b, you will notice that the curve um, looks sort of like this, where a is going to be our um, horizontal asymptote, so the length that the fish approaches. And you can think of that because it describes the length of fishes, that the fishes, of course, grow according to this curve. So in the beginning, they're teeny tiny little guys, and then towards the end, they approach this horizontal asymptote, and their length will be limited by this value. Notice here that we needed very little actual calculus, but we did interpret what the initial and what the final growth of the fish is using limiting values and using simple justifications about what happens to very small and very large powers of E. It is a powerful tool to simply be able to justify without much actual calculation what the model is and what the different parameters in the model signify.